Welcome to this special episode of Better Life Today. You know, one of the benefits of being a local ministry is that we get to talk to local people. And today I have with me Margaret Varner, and you're with the Rogue Valley Humane Society. Correct. Welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you know, there are so many opportunities we have to serve in our communities, and I, we love animals in our family. And so I am very, I, we have a couple of labs that like to get out periodically, and you guys are one of my first calls. And I just love that we have these organizations that are there to provide a service that sometimes we don't really think about. So as we're introducing this, tell me a little bit about yourself, Margaret. Well, this is my 18th year at the Humane Society. Okay. And I just, um, as I was saying earlier, I eat, sleep, and drink it. I can't imagine being anywhere else. Uh -huh. We love our community. Well, very good. And you know, we had Jeanette in here earlier showing you pictures of her dog and, and the cats. And I, you could just, Watching it from my seat, you could just see the love you have for animals. And so it looks to me like you are in the perfect position. I am very, very grateful every day, you know, to be able to wake up and say, I look forward to being to work and who I work with and just a great community. I feel very blessed to be in the position that I am in. Right. So tell me a little bit about the Humane Society here. Well, the Humane Society started in 1966 and it actually started in a small room um, at a veterinarian office on Williams Highway. Um, a group of sweet people got together and they realized there was a need for Humane Society because there was not one. Um, then it moved over to what is our thrift store now, and now we're up on Scenic. Okay. And so um, throughout this 56 or so years, we've slowly grown, and it's, it's, been, it's been fabulous. So this one serves the Grants Pass area? Yes. Okay. So we do Grants Pass, but we also help um, in, in case of like disasters, things like that. We've brought mm. dogs from New Orleans. Um, we have worked with uh, the Sato Project from Puerto Rico. And so, you know, we don't limit just to Josephine County. If there's people that we can help, it doesn't matter. That's where we're going to right. do, you know, going so, to be. So we had the fires just a couple years ago. You were probably heavily involved in so, that. So yes, um, the Humane Society and myself, um, I'm part of the Josephine County evacuation team. So mm. we work very closely with the Red Cross. Um, we actually set up for a couple of weeks at the fairgrounds and um, we stay round the clock and we do shifts and we wow. help the, the folks with their pets and when they need to evacuate, we're there for them. That, that's fantastic. I just, I, I know as we saw the fires raging in our area, we're up in the woods a little bit. And so to know that there are resources, because that's one of the concerns, right, is what, what's going to happen to my animals if we're that's separated it. or... That's it. So, you know, we're really lucky in this community that people are very oriented um, towards helping each other. Mm -hmm. And so even though when we're out at the fairgrounds and it's a two week, you know, long, you just never know how long you're going to be out there and having to keep your day to day operations going. But you're out there helping the people. This last fire season, I remember spraying off my roof as I was heading out to the fairgrounds to make sure you know others were being helped and cared for with their pets. And, right. And it's, it's just a scary feeling, but again, that sense of community is just amazing here. Right, now, I mean, how, how large is your staff? So my staff currently, there's about 15 of us, um, but we do have a surgical suite. Um, we have a thrift store as well. Mm -hmm. So we do the spays and neuters um, for some of the local rescue groups and ourselves and the, the care of the animals. So we have dogs and cats and sometimes you just never know what you're going to get. You know, right. um, we've brought in pigs, we've brought in horses, we've dealt with um, some goats. We've done a, a very large goat rescue. I think there was 40 
Wow. And um, we were doing, with our, our um, volunteers, we had a, a foster program. And so the volunteers would go over to one of our volunteers' house and care for all 40 of the goats. Right. One of the pictures was a goat standing in her dishwasher. And it was like really on the door and he's <laughs> kind of looking in and it was a baby goat, of course. Right. But you just never know what, what the day is going to bring. Right. And 15 sounds like a lot of people, but when you're talking being at the fairground and around the clock, I would think that you have a pretty large volunteer base as well. We do. You know, it just depends. We have a lot of snowbirds in the area, mm -hmm. and, and we have a lot of episodic volunteers. And so when it comes to fire season, we really pull from our core volunteers. Uh, we actually sent two of our main volunteers to the Paradise area, oh. um, and they, they were there gosh, uh, maybe three weeks. Wow. And it was coming up with a reuniting system and, and pet um, tags and just really a lot of information. A lot of animals were displaced during that fire. And so again, you know, it's not just our community. We take our skills and if we can help somebody else, that's what we like to do. Right. So as I'm, I'm familiarizing myself I, with this topic, it's the Humane Society. And my, my preconceived notion there was that, well, there's probably a nationwide network, but it sounds like these are local entities. They are. So you're each, you're just so operated independently. That's a very good question. There's a Humane Society in the United States, which we're not affiliated with. Mm -hmm. It's just, um, we can pull from resources from time to time. We can request grants, but... Um, basically, each individual humane society is a 501c3 nonprofit organization that is is sustaining themselves right. by volunteers and um, the community donations, bequests, uh, fundraisers. So that's how we stay stay um, operating. Right. Yeah. So tell me a little bit more about that. How how do you do your fundraising? What does that oh look like, goodness. especially <laughs> in the last couple of years where those kind of things have been a little bit more difficult? That's another great question. It's It's been very challenging in these last few years because uh, typically we have about 800000 to a $1 million to raise depending on what we're doing and mm. what's going on. And that's per year. And Yes, per okay. year. And um, so it's been quite a challenge. Typically, every month we do an event, whether it's furball or blues, brews, and barbecue, or um, Mother's Day high tea, or bowling for Bowsers or Meowsers. You know, we have to be really creative. Yeah. Um, we just finished up with Petals for Pets, mm -hmm. and that's where we um, were delivering roses with a cute little note and a ribbon. And so it's just coming up with a lot of creative ways to yeah. keep our doors open. So we've been doing furball this last couple of years online, which is a whole new experience. So what what is itself. furball? So furball this year is our 13th annual furball, and it's one of our largest fundraisers. Mm -hmm. um, what it is is typically we go out to a, a nice place, whether it's the golf course, and we have a high-end meal, and we do a silent auction, a live auction, and some raffles and all of it benefits the animals. So I look for business sponsorships, sure. and typically there's about 135 people that join us, and it's a great time to thank our donors for really the support, and we get to get dressed up out of yeah, our jeans, absolutely. which is really nice. <laughs> and But um, this year, Furball is, is different. It's online. Mm -hmm. um, we'll be sending out appetizer boxes, and we'll have the choice between vegan, vegetarian, or um, just little appetizer trays. Um, and people can purchase, we'll have about eight to 12 really large gift items mm -hmm. and hoping that the auction really goes well because again, that's what helps keeps our door, Abs doors open absolutely. and um, wages paid. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, and we'll, we'll get your information up on the screen later on, but is there, are there resources like on your website where people can find out about your yes. upcoming events and yes. whatnot? Yes, definitely check out um, the www.roguevalleyhumanesociety.org. Mm -hmm. We're open Monday through Saturday as well, and feel free to come on in um, from noon to three, chat with staff, mm -hmm. and also check out our Facebook page. Always have a lot of information on there. Right, awesome. So speaking of visiting, do you have to have an appointment to come and check out your animals? So um, with the COVID regulations, yes, right now we are asking for appointments only. Um, sometimes people do pop in and if we're able to help them out, uh, we definitely will at that time. Otherwise, we will set a little schedule for mm -hmm. them. We ask that people uh, fill out a pre-adoption 
uh, application so we can review it, send in their pictures, and go from there. Because especially when we have puppies, you would be surprised. Um, sometimes we get so many applications and people are like, well, I had mine in first. Right. And it's not first come, first serve. It's the best match right. for the pet. And you, get, you have the luxury of being picky. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. For us, it's it's not about just getting them in and mm -hmm. out. It's about finding that right match. Right. So if you have that couch potato mentality, well, we're going to match you up with the right. couch potato dog and definitely not like a Jack Russell Terrier. Right. And, and so it's really, if you like to hike, we're going to get that sporty dog for you. So right. definitely matching up lifestyles. I love that. We actually adopted a Bernese Mountain Dog when oh. we lived in Graham, Washington. And I was amazed at, you know, I felt like I was putting in an application for for school or something where, you know, I had to, we had to give very specific information and then there were some site visits as oh, well. Oh, we do. We definitely yeah. do. And I appreciated that because you know, there's, you want to make sure the animals are cared for. We do. You know, it's so much more than just an adoption. I mean, we put every bit of heart into it and we care about the animals and we care about the community too. So it's really important to us to make sure that we're having good matches. Has that become more difficult to match up? Are people, it seems like early in COVID, everybody was wanting pets. Oh, yes. And has it changed? Are it people, has. are now some people letting their pets go? Is that created that they, problem? Absolutely. They've been returning them um, a lot more um, frequently now that people are going back to work mm -hmm. and wanting to get out and vacation. And it just hurts our heart that right now there's a lull in adoptions. And so what we do is we have a network of transportation. Um, we work with other facilities like Portland Humane Society mm. where they have different demographics and they're adopting out animals a lot quicker. And so that's what we do. And that way animals just don't sit and right. we're able to kind of scoot them along and, and find better placement for them and then bring more in. Right, so how, how long traditionally, is there an average on how long animals usually well, are in your facility? Well, it depends. I mean, it depends. It's really breed um, specific. If we have a golden retriever, I can tell you that they're not gonna sit too <laughs> right, long. Right. We have people that are like, oh, I'll, I'll raise that adoption fee. And right. so, you know, but it's not about that. Again, it's about the right match and so, um, it just depends on the breed, right. behavior. Okay, like that. so is there a cost to adopt an animal? There is, so for puppies it's $300 mm -hmm. and there's a lot of medical that goes into it and we feed really good food. And, um, and they're probably spayed and neutered. They absolutely, and, yeah. everybody is spayed and neutered. Yeah. They get vaccinated, flea treated, heartworm tested, mm. the works. And so we also send people home with a um, free wellness check and some samples of food and some other little goodies. Uh, so dog or puppies are 300, dogs are 165 and up, and cats are 85, I believe. Right, <laughs> and they could go to your yeah. website or call you Absolutely. to get, get more specific Absolutely. information. Yes, and kitten season is coming. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it sure is. We, we're seeing a lot of cats around our place. You know, we're gonna take a quick break, and I just, I'm so grateful we have uh, Margaret Varner here with us from the Rogue River Rogue he, Valley, Rogue Valley thank you, Rogue Valley Humane Society. And we're gonna take a quick break and then we'll be right back to talk more. Stay tuned. Better Life Broadcasting is a viewer supported Christian media ministry that offers streaming programming via apps on various devices. Please visit blbn.org to support Better Life or to get more information. And don't forget to like and subscribe. Welcome back. I'm just so pleased to be joined by Margaret Varner. She's with the Rogue Valley Humane Society. Um, thank you for correcting me on that. Um, so we talked about some of the programs that you have, and I wanted to dig into that a little bit more. Okay. So let's talk about some of the things you do. You have, you have a food pantry. Yes. Yeah, so last year, our food pantry helped over 5,000 individual households with pet food at no expense. It's all by donations from the community. Mm. How does that work? Do they come in? Or? So yeah, folks are able to come on in and Monday through Saturday, um, we're able to help them out with dog or 
pet food. We also have our Animals program, which we deliver to over 40 homebound seniors pet really? food once a month. Okay. And, and so typically it's dogs and cats, but um, on occasion we will help out some chickens or some goats if we have the extra food available. Right. That, that's wonderful. You know, I, you see these scenes of, of hungry animals and, and sometimes, you know, sometimes I think the neglect is intentional, but a lot of times you just don't have the resource or the transportation or whatever. Right, right. And you know, that's what we find with the Animals program. It's really important to be one um, with the community mm -hmm. and our seniors really need our help. And something as simple as going out and offering a bag of pet food. If it means to keep that pet in the home, that's what we want to do. We want to be really good um, pet partners with folks right. and make sure we keep the animals in the home with grandma um, or grandpa. It really helps lessen their stress, keeps sure. their blood pressure down. Our volunteers going out, it's nice because they, sometimes folks don't get to have visitors mm. and just oh, something yeah. as simple as is a, a nice chat when they're dropping off the food you can look down and see their pet and judge oh my goodness they might need their nails trimmed or they're a little overweight and how can we help right and so that's what we do that's that is so cool but sometimes the fit is just not right so Right. You offer a foster care program, is that correct? So we do. Um, when the fit isn't right, we ask that folks definitely bring the pet back. And really what we're trying to do is build a pet-centric community model. And what that means is instead of during these times when people are returning animals, we want you to be part of the process. We mm -hmm. want you to help us place those dogs. And who knows best about the pet than the prior owner? Right. And so... Um, we might not be as eager to bring them in because sometimes it's not just suitable for the pet. If it's a senior pet, they don't do well housed and sometimes cats can be finicky and if they're put in a cage, they don't do well either. So keeping them in foster homes really helps and um, we're able to give resources online, try to match folks up with that perfect pet to keep them out of the facility. Right. So. And I, and I love that. We, like, we adopted the Bernese Mountain Dog some years ago, um, but even now, we, I think I shared with you that we have two labs, and we adopted Riley. He's a black lab, a little bit younger than Cora, and they have so much fun together, but the whole process, you know, we got Riley from an older family that he was more energetic right, than they had right. expected, and it was a blessing. It all worked out, but to have a resource like you provide that can kind of guide people through that process, it would have been a lot easier for us. It's, you know, it's really nice. Um, we do have a very beautiful facility, but the goal is, is if we can put them straight from house to house, if it's not working out, mm -hmm. that's, that's the preference. Right. Yeah. What is the community like as far as number? Are there a lot of animals out there? There is, there really is. And um, it's, it's really tough, you know, when you see so many breeders and knowing that the shelters are full, mm -hmm. go to your shelters first, you know. I, I know, I appreciate breeders too because we mm -hmm. do wanna keep certain breeds going and, and that, but again, you can get purebred animals at facilities right. very easily. So check with us first. <laughs> and if, I know one of our employees had a basically a cat colony on on her property and was bringing them in i would i would guess maybe to your facility do you offer services like spaying and neutering absolutely so we have a voucher program um it's www.vouchers at rogue valley humane mm -hmm. society.org feel free to email us get yourself on the list what what happens is it generates another email letting you know exactly how the program works uh there's a couple of things we offer low-cost spay and neuter vouchers mm -hmm. um but we also also really have been working hard on our community cats and like you said one of your staff members was dealing with a colony and I always tell people that they're no different than a skunk a possum raccoon when you're dealing with a wild kitty they didn't ask to be you know dumped or left and sometimes the worst thing that you can do is bring them into a facility and put them in a kennel so what we do is we go out and we'll do mass um, trapping, neutering, spaying, mm. and releasing. 
we snip their ear and that way, and it's just a little snip on the right. top, um, that way other people that are working on colonies know, oh, I've trapped one that's already been spayed and neutered, if you oh, see their they little can just ear release tip. them. Yeah. yeah, and that way you're saving money on surgical um, expenses and having the kitty go through the stress of being trapped and yeah. taken in. So um, with the voucher program, this year we really, we have tripled the amount of community cats that we have funded and spayed and neutered and released. Uh, if we find that people have colonies that are being abused, we sometimes will locate the entire colony, uh, relocate the entire oh, colony. Okay. And that that's a really tough one. Um, we try to keep them in the same area that they come from. But if that's not the case, then we'll send them off to like a barn home or a business that might need a mouser, things like that. Right. So we try to be creative. So I'm starting to get a feel for why fundraising is so important because these are it's these are not inexpensive things no, to deal with. No, it's so expensive. I mean, for some of the local spays for just a cat, you're looking at over two hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. And being a nonprofit during these times for everybody, it, it's been tough, whether you're nonprofit or not. But right when you have um, a community that's depending on you to be there, that's really, it, it's, it's been tough to keep our doors open. So definitely donate, uh, give us a call, see how you can help. If you can't donate, maybe donate your time. Mm -hmm. If you can't donate your time, maybe just spread the information as right. to what we're doing and how you can help. Right, tell me about TNR. TNR, so Trap, Neuter, Spay, mm -hmm. Release. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a lot. Uh, we just worked with a local company, Grovers, and their staff was amazing. Um, the owners of, of Grovers really stepped up to the plate. They had a colony of probably 22 cats oh in their parking lot. Okay. And they were just running rampant and they were breeding. And so every 62 days, kittens. And mm. that was becoming a problem. Um, the, the staff was- <laughs> Sounds like an exponential was, problem. Yeah, they were so stressed. They didn't know, you know, what to do. And so they reached out to us and they said, you have a TNR program, can you help us? So. Mm -hmm. I personally went down and I set the traps and first thing we do is we set um, feeder traps and get them used to going in the traps. They don't close on them and you just kind of tarp them and, and make it comfortable and just get them used to the idea of being fed in that area mm -hmm. and it takes about a week to do that and then you bring in the traps early morning, trap kitties and take them to the facility to be spayed and neutered. Right. Then we release them but Grover's was really fabulous, their, their staff, um, the owners, they chipped in for um, this, the cost of all mm -hmm. of it. So that was really nice. When businesses really chip in, uh, it helps because it is a community problem. Right, and it, it becomes a partnership. It, it, it really is, and we really, we appreciate folks that are looking to help with the partnership, and we understand that not everybody can afford funding-wise, mm -hmm. but if we can have some help, that's really nice. Right, and one of those partnerships would be the adoption process where people could come in. So my understanding is you have some really cute pictures we do. you could share with us of, of different animals you have available, and I'm sure this is just a small sampling. It, it is. Well, I can start off showing you Manny. Manny's a Wheaton Terrier. He's a little over two years old, and this guy just didn't have such a great start, unfortunately, and now he lives lives in Eugene, um, we built a Manny cave for him, and it's a, a tiny house uh -huh. where he is comfortable. Um, we're hoping that he'll be available soon for adoption. He just is gonna still have to go through a lot of training. Currently, he is in foster care mm -hmm. with some other folks who were going to adopt him, but it's just not working out. Right. So back to the trainer, Manny goes, and uh -huh. so he will be available. Always very cute. Definitely um, an only pet, though, right. only pet. Then we have little Agatha Christie here. <laughs> There's about three puppies that we have currently and they're about 11, 12 weeks old. Mm. They're available for adoption as well. And that's here at your facility locally. Yes, Very yes. Cool. And then we have a couple of kitties. Aww. There's this one that's available. Um, another. Oh, what pretty colors. Very nice kitties, very loving. Let's see what else. I can just show you cat and dog pictures all day long. Yeah. <laughs> we have another. That's a little domestic short hair tuxedo kitties, which mm. I don't know if you know, but black cats and dogs are always the last to get adopted. Um, it's just 
personal preference, huh. superstition, I'm not sure, but um, I think for that reason is why I have seven black cats at home. Right, well there you go. <laughs> I've reached my limit. <laughs> and how long does an animal normally stay in your facility? Typically our length of stay, you know, it, it does vary. We um, will transfer an animal if it's there longer than three weeks to another facility with different demographics where they will get adopted quicker. Mm -hmm. So it's just case by case. Then we have Bubba here and Bubba, he actually came from animal control. He is a, um, a shepherd uh, pity blend and he's so sweet, but he's just not a fan of all of the other dogs. Currently we have him with his buddy Loki. And Loki, he's a super, oh my goodness, <laughs> this boy, he's a beast. It's like you just really have to pay attention because he'll come charging at you and yeah. just take you out. But as you see, he's got a few toys. Yeah, he's a Kong collector. He, he loves those Kongs. <laughs> and these both are buddies. I mean, uh -huh. the two of them are next to each other and right. they just adore each other. So let's see. And then I have beautiful Greta Ray. And she's, she's a handful. She's a very big dog mm -hmm. and definitely needs to be the only pet at home. Uh, she just wants to be your one and only. Right. And she's two year old and she is, I wanna say Great Pyrenees Rottweiler blend. Mm. Well, very good. And again, this is just a sampling of the many animals you have at your facility. So thank you so much for coming in. Thank We're you gonna for put me. your website information and phone numbers up. So folks, if you, if you have a heart for animals and you want to volunteer your time, uh, your money, if you're looking to adopt a pet, please, please, please reach out to Margaret. And again, I'm just so thankful that we have, there's so much need in our communities for different things and to know that there are people out there like you that are looking out for the animals and, and looking out for the people too who need companionship and well, whatnot. It's, it's just, it's a real, real pleasure to meet you today. Thanks for having me, appreciate all of the kind words, and I can't imagine being anywhere else but this community helping animals and people. Right. Well, Thanks for having good. me. Thank you. Folks, have a great rest of your day, and again, just look for opportunities you have to engage in the community. There are so many worthwhile causes, and please take a look at their website, and we'll see you next time on the next episode of Better Life Today. Goodbye. <laughs>